Good evening. Welcome to the Mightier Expert Series, where we talk about using the science of child development to help us all become better parents. My name is Jason Kahn, and I do these webinars. We make them very, very short. They're 10 minutes long. We try to hold to that. We are all busy people. I am a parent too, and I know that feeling. So just quickly who I am. Um, as I said, my name is Jason. I am one of the founders. I am the Chief Science Officer at Videar. I am on the faculty at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, Longtime viewers of the webinar will notice a couple different things today. So first of all, we're on Zoom. That is a big improvement for me. I hope it's been was easy for you to get here. Uh, the second thing is that I am by myself. I normally get a lot of questions out in my day to day about how the science behind my dear can help a, can help become a better parent. And I wanted to be able to spend a little bit of time with you guys with really talking about how the lessons that are sort of native and woven into the fabric of Mightier really could impact parenting on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis and really things that I take into my own parenting. Um, as you guys take a look at my own two children who are Sam and Penny chowing down on ice cream, I want to emphasize if you take one thing from this webinar that there is, you know, there are no hard and fast rules. These are only guidelines, right? So one of the frustrating and very liberating things about science is that it is always tentative. Uh, and I am very much a scientist in that regard. I, you know, I, I know that whatever gets said is going to be revised as we learn more and as we take more and more information in. And you know, in that light, it really liberates us. You know, you take the best that everybody knows, but you also weave it in with your common sense and you, you just make things and you figure out what works for your own family. So on that note, I want to introduce you to the three big levels where we think about how children grow. So the first of these is physical development. So this is really the biological growth of your child. Think of things like nutrition and exercise having a huge impact on the physical development of your child. Uh, the second thing is cognitive development. So we pay a lot of attention to this, especially at school. Uh, I apologize for my voice. I'm fighting off a cold. People who know me know that I sound like a frog. If you don't know like, what I sound like, I sound like a frog right now. Um, I don't normally sound like one. Uh, cognitive development is really, um, it's the stuff we think about at school. It's reading and it's math. It's, you know, it is more than that. So even skills like chess or reading piano music could be on that line. And then the last of these is social emotional development. And, you know, Unfortunately, we don't pay great attention to social emotional growth, but it really is, it's equal to the other two. And we really want to figure out how we can build balanced children as time goes on. So in my brief time with you this evening, I really want to talk about, as we think about some of the big lessons from child development, how they can directly impact your child's social emotional growth. And, you know, as we do this, also keep in mind that the barriers between them are not as harsh as they might seem. You know, I brought up the piano example before. Yeah, there's the, there's the being able to read the music, which is a cognitive skill, but being able to touch those fingers and remember and build that muscle memory is a little bit of a physical skill. Um, mightier families will know there's a huge overlap between like the biology of emotion and how we teach children to regulate. So there's, you know, there's always this balance going on between the two. And really you ignore one of these domains that you're, you know, at, the, at your own peril, it's you really got to build a, you really got to focus and try to build balance across all three. So, I want to do something a little silly here and ask you guys what the shape of the Earth is. Take a second. Uh, it's not a trick question. I want you to know, answer what the shape of the Earth is. Okay, you do that. Good, thank you. You probably all instantly realized that it was round, but. I want you to think about how would you know that, especially if you're a child, you look around, you see the horizon and everything is flat. And one of the things that people do, which is actually pretty funny, is they actually, they ask kids to describe what the shape of the earth is. And kids are always doing this balancing act, right? So they hear adults say, the shape of the earth is round, the shape of the earth is round. Maybe they even see a globe, but they look around at the horizon and they have to build for themselves from the ground up what on earth the shape of the earth is. And so you see things like the snow globe in the upper left or, you know, this little tiny sphere with a sky above it in the middle. Um, 
all these ideas, or I love the one on the bottom right, right? So like, yeah, I live down here, that round, whatever they're talking about, that must be up in the sky, that round earth. Um, the kids are building them from the bottom up. And really, you know, this applies to really, this is how kids learn. They're always building up. And what's cool about this is that there's always more. You can always build on it. Um, and these kids, they'll be, as they get confronted with new information, they have to extend their models. They have to extend their models well, well until it breaks. Uh, there's even a fancy name for that, um, breaking, which, you know, I mean, it's, it's really exciting. Like, you know, this, this whole, the, the brain just gets, you have to reorganize all everything you know. Um, and what you thought, sort of, it's a little violent, right? It comes toppling down. And, you know, you are probably wondering, rightly so, like, okay, so how do I apply this to my child's social emotional growth, right? And, you know, I think it's tempting, right? Because you're like, okay, well, if my child is just going to co construct all the information for themselves, okay, well, that means I just leave them alone to their own devices. And uh, if you answer yes to that, it's got to be a very, very subtle yes, right? And so I'm raising a five-year-old, right? And one of the... A, a, People who are listening to this are obviously parents. You guys, you guys have probably gone through this stage already, but five-year-olds tend to whine. And so for me, the corrective a action here is not like, you know, stop whining, here are alternatives, let me present you with some strategies that aren't whining. But it is more to, it's just to build a world where whining is not going to work. And so that means for us, for me and my wife, that means ignoring the whine. And you know, the whining in and of itself is an adaptive strategy. Our child is used to like, that's how I get what I want. So the first time that whining doesn't work, uh, I don't expect any magic right off the bat, right? It's actually is really frustrating for this strategy that you've invested in and that you've built up that you're used to having working uh, for it to all of a sudden not work. So you know, predictably enough, you get angry, right? Second time, get angry. Third time, get angry. Hopefully if you're really lucky on that fourth time, you know, maybe a new strategy starts to emerge. And what's really cool and really magical about that is that your child has built that up for themselves and it's theirs and it's their own and they, they've seen and they've built it up. And the second that happens, then you as the sort of curator of this world, you get to jump on that and like celebrate the living daylights out of that moment. And it's really, really exciting. And, you know, for you, I mean, you're a you're a constructivist in action. You are letting your child build the strategies, build these social emotional strategies around them and really make them their own. I do want to point out there is another side of this story, which is that you do as the parent, you get to choose the challenges and situations that your child is exposed to. So, you know, you probably notice that what your child can accomplish on their own and what they can accomplish with help are very different things. When you sit down and you work with your child on something together, you're guiding how they participate um, and how they basically how they what arrow they take. And you know the cool thing about this is whether you realize it or not, you're an expert at this. Uh, you did it when your child was a baby. You guided them through language. You probably used baby talk, and all of this is like this very adaptive way to help children and this really amazing cultural tool of language emerge. Um, to speak directly, I, if families on this webinar are using my dear, um, I want to speak directly to you for a second and really say like this scaffolding can be very powerful in your use of my dear, which is to say that I really like it when families play my dear with their kids, right? So what you're doing then is you are showing your child, you're saying like, okay, these are the, these, these are the values that I have and this is how I approach learning. You're saying that I want to be a learner in this domain. You're letting your child verbalize their strategies. Um, and you're showing them that you care. And that really, that's, that's a huge piece of scaffolding social emotional learning is this idea that you too are a learner and you too don't have all the answers and you too have emotions. Um, and, you know, every time you do this, you might probably don't realize it, but you're taking like 100 years of child development theory and you're bringing them right into your living room and making them a part of how your family grows and learns. So, you know, it's probably fair to ask at this point, how do I know these strategies work? And, you know, I think for me, I've seen them work. They, they are, as I said at the very beginning, they're woven into the fabric of my dear. They are, we see them when we look at our clinical results. So this is data from when I was at Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, we did a lot of clinical trials on my dear, and we saw such 
such drastic behavior change in children and such a blossoming of the family environment when we did this was really powerful. Um, and I practice what I preach. I mean, everything that I'm talking about here is strategies that I use in my own family. I am by no means perfect. I don't even, I would never pretend otherwise. But you know, I mean, like I said, it is a, it's always a work in progress. And what's cool about these strategies is that they really, they're, they're very freeing, right? Because there's no, there's no finish line for children. And every child is going to have their own starting line. And that starting line is going to look different based on what skill or thing or strategy you're talking about for that child. But when there's no finish line and there's not even a race course, your child can never be off of it, right? So everything becomes an opportunity to learn and you just sort of become, you're free to enjoy this crazy adventure and really look at it as like, okay, like how can I, how can I build on this? How can I improve and how can I work with my child differently next time?